This episode of Literary Treks is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and to help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. Hey everyone, I'm Rod Roddenberry and you're listening to Trek FM. taking all these books? I thought I'd take some light reading, in case I got bored. Welcome, everyone, to episode 246 of Literary Treks, your dedicated Star Trek books and comics show here on the Trek FM network. And joining me, as he does every time, is the wonderful, the honorable Bruce Gibson. Bruce, how are you today? I am a Klingon today, Dan. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, no, that augment virus cure went really wrong, didn't it? (laughs) It did, but I feel so much healthier now. Excellent. Awesome. Well, we have Klingon Bruce Gibson joining us today. Well, it's probably a good thing that you're in Klingon form because we're talking about a uniquely Klingon novel today. In the feature today, we're going to be talking about the first book in the IKS Gorkon series, and that's A Good Day to Die by Keith R. A. DeCandido. Ah, sounds great to me. You know, I've been eating my Ruffles chips because I like ridges. (laughs) (laughs) All right, I'm done. I'm done, everyone. Don't worry. (laughs) I love it. Well, so yeah, it's going to be a very Klingon episode. And we have a special guest joining us to talk about that book later on in the feature. But before we get there, we should talk a little bit about some big news that came out a little while ago. Now, this is pretty cool. You may remember a few weeks ago, and you've probably heard this by now because we do record these episodes quite a bit before uh, they are released, but it's still really cool news and we do want to talk about it a bit. Artist J.K. Woodward, who does a lot of the comic book art, released a kind of teaser on Instagram where he showed a little piece of Riker that he was painting. And before that, he showed a little quark that he was painting as well. Well, now we finally get to see what that's from. And this is really exciting. We've got a new mini series coming from IDW called Star Trek The Q Conflict. And this is really cool because for the first time ever, this comic book series will bring together the crews of Star Trek, the original series, the next generation, Deep Space Nine and Voyager. And this will be a six episode series, a six issue comic book series debuting in January of 2019. And that piece of art that we saw was just a little tiny little itty bitty square of the whole piece of art which uh, if you haven't seen it you should check it out features all four crews voyager ds9 tng and the original series with this gorgeous background of like you know the night sky and a sunset with q kind of looming over them in his judge's robes and this is all part of a retailer incentive cover that has been done by jk woodward so this looks really really cool it does and i mean his art is always fantastic and this just this piece is 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 great i mean i would love to have a poster of this on the wall and of course you know notice where's the star trek enterprise crew they're not on Mm -hmm. here but then again maybe there's only so many crews you can fit yeah i mean I've seen online a lot of people are kind of disappointed that Enterprise isn't a part of this, but I mean, you've got these four crews and 
that's a lot of people to work into this series in six issues. So, uh, you know, I love Enterprise and it would be pretty cool if they were included as well. But, you know, this looks pretty great with the characters we have here as well. And I don't know. I don't know how many more people you could fit into this story. So, <laughs> yeah. And we haven't really seen Enterprise in the comics outside of a Waypoint issue. So Enterprise mm-hmm. really hasn't been treated well when it comes to comics. So maybe there's some rights issues or something like that. But no, I mean, this looks really interesting. I mean, we've had crossovers between these four crews before in the novels, but this will be the first time actually having all four in the comics uh, together in a series like this. So the series, it's being written by Scott and David Tipton, who have done a lot of really great comic work for IDW, Mirror Broken, for example. Uh, the art IDW has David Messina doing the artwork and you might know his work from cloak and dagger and star Trek countdown. And of course, like I mentioned, there will be multiple covers. There'll be regular covers by David Messina. And like I mentioned, retailer incentive variants by JK Woodward and George Kaltsudas. <laughs> I'm very sorry, George, if I've mispronounced your name, but uh, Kats- Kaltsudas is my best guess on that one. So yeah, this looks really, really cool. There is an official synopsis. When a dispute between godlike beings threatens the galaxy, it will take all of Starfleet's best captains to stop them. James T. Kirk, Jean-Luc Picard, Catherine Janeway, and Benjamin Sisko must go head-to-head in a competition rigged by the arrogant Q and his nigh-omnipotent cohorts. So not only is it bringing all these crews together, but it looks like they'll be pitted against one one another in some sort of competition as well. Well, you know, I wonder who will win if they're in a competition with each (laughs) other. That would be pretty interesting. I'm going to bet TNG. That's just my bet. Oh, man, it's Kirk versus Picard all over again, but we've got Janeway and Sisko in there, too. Oh, man, I don't know. This is rough. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. It, it's going to, yeah, I, we'll just have to see. But you know what? It looks like there's less members on the TOS crew. Or no, they're about hmm. the same as TNG, but the others, I think, have a few more people, or at least one more. Yeah, it looks like Voyager. Voyager has the advantage. They have one more than everyone else. Everyone's got seven on their team. And Voyager's got uh, eight. So uh, depending on where Worf's li- loyalties lie between TNG and DS9, I guess that'll maybe that'll be the clincher. So I don't know. We might see Voyager get a flag. Uh, too many players on the field. Uh, yeah, there we go. Well, they'll claim that one of them's holographic, so he doesn't really count. That's true. He <laughs> doesn't count. Oh, no, don't don't send me hate mail. The doctor counts. The EMH counts. Don't worry. Don't worry. He He's real. <laughs> well, and also, you know, Cisco's team might have a slight handicap as well, because everyone is, you know, trained officers, whether they're Bajoran militia or or Starfleet officers, with the exception of Quark. Quark's on Cisco's team as well, and he might might be a bit of a liability. And where's Jake? Jake's Where is there. Jake? Jake always gets the short shrift, man. You know, we were talking on the other side of the page with our guest, who I'll reveal now is Justin Ozer, about how Morn is in more episodes of Deep Space Nine than Jake. How sad is that? Like, I wish this uh, series was called like the Morn Conflict, and it was oh. Morn that brings the four crews together because he's going through the Guardian. And he's creating all kinds of havoc and he's changing history because he's talking too much about the future. I love it. I love it. And have them all in competitions against one another, you know, in order to raise funds to pay for his drinking bill. I I love it. I love it. (laughs) And Cork is all excited because he's finally getting paid. (laughs) Perfect. I think we've read, we've written the next series. We need to call up IDW. This is why we do the show. Exactly. Well, speaking of competitions with really high stakes between heroes pitted against one one another, what do you say we jump into the feature and talk about a good day to die? Coupla. So on today's episode, we are talking about the novel IKS Gorkon, book one, A Good Day to Die by author Keith R.A. DeCandido. So this is pretty exciting. This is the start of a new book series, new at the time. Uh, books that I don't think any of us have read yet. Is that right? Yeah, I've never read it. That's right. Wait, wait. Was there a third voice there? Who's that? Who's 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 hiding back there? Who is that? 
It's a Klingon, I think. Hmm. Well, it makes sense. That's all that's in this book. He's got a <laughs> like a goatee. <laughs> oh, he's an original series Klingon. He's in Wait a, a minute. dark room, too. <laughs> that's just yeah, an guys, I didn't, I didn't put on my ridges today, so how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Not too bad. Good to have you on the show, Justin. Oh, great to be here. I think this is my sixth time here, so oh, it's nice. exciting. Oh, Hard well, then you get the prize for the most guest appearances. Yeah, and I think actually we've got the punch card. So once you get eight, <laughs> you get a free something. I don't know. Yeah, we'll think free something. something. Join you'll my- send an uh, you'll send an author to my house, and they will write their Star Trek novel in my house from whatever that I want them to do for three months. <laughs> Scenes from a hat, Star Trek style. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Dayton Ward, are you there in the green room? Uh, you're the prize. <laughs> yeah, Dayton Ward has volunteered to do that. By the way. Awesome. He's coming well, up. Awesome. It's, it's just always delightful to be with you guys. I think it's been about three months since I was on. Yeah, it's been a little while. Always good to have you on the show and, and good to have you back for sure. Especially to talk about this because this is kind of a unique novel. And uh, like I said, it's Ikea Gorkon book one, A Good Day to Die. And this is following the exploits of the crew of the Ikea Gorkon, a Klingon ship, Chancellor class. And they're all named after different chancellors. You may, of course, remember Chancellor Gorkon from Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. Don't let it end this way, Captain. That was good. So dramatic. I expect more dramatic readings. That was great. (laughs) (laughs) I'm a David Warner fan. What can I say? But yeah, so um, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about just the structure of this novel and what makes it up, because I didn't really think about this until I got finished reading it. But there's not a single Starfleet character in this novel, and I don't think I've ever read a Star Trek novel where that was the case. I could be wrong, but, you know, just kind of quickly going through it in my head, I don't think I have. Yeah, it was interesting you pointed that out in in the outline because, okay, there are no Starfleet characters, but we do see Worf, who's an ambassador, so former Starfleet at that point. But I did actually think of a novel I've read that had no Starfleet characters. So in the Terok Nor trilogy, which is about the Bajoran occupation, the second book, Night of the Wolves, has absolutely no Starfleet characters. The first and the third have a few, but the second one has none. And I love that whole series. And and it was interesting to see it from that perspective because you really get into, and in this book, you really get into the people that are on the Klingon ship and uh, and has nothing to do with Starfleet, really. I mean, it's really about internal Klingon stuff. Have you read others, Bruce, that have no Starfleet characters? I, I'm trying to think of one. The books you just mentioned I have not read, um, but I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that wouldn't have some kind of Starfleet characters. Now, I haven't read The Worlds of Deep Space Nine. Did that? Did all those stories have a Starfleet character in them? Oh, you're, you're, you're testing my memory because it's been some years. It's possible that there's some that don't have Starfleet characters. Mm-hmm. It's po- the only ones that I can't... The, Car- the Cardassian one definitely does because it has O'Brien. The Trill one does because it has Esri. Uh, the Ferengi one may not. Yeah, I was just saying the uh, the two that, I can, that I'm can that not sure of would be either the Dominion or the Ferengi one. So it's possible. But still, it's quite rare if we can only think of a few. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I do have to say, I did also read the Terok Nor trilogy, so I hadn't thought of that. So uh, good call. It, it on was one. one of the things, I'd read it more recently. It was one of the things I thought of, although the it's only the second novel because the first and third do have some Starfleet characters. But mm-hmm. yeah, it makes for a different feel. Because even if you think about something like the final reflection that is just so Klingon centric, it's still bookended by the stuff with Starfleet characters. Right. Yeah. Right? They're still in there. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. interesting. Good trivia right there. <laughs> I like that. Very That's good. awesome. So basically, Keith DeCandido has a bit of a challenge here writing this story from the Klingon perspective. And I just want to ask you guys quickly, do you think that the book remains faithful to the idea of life from the Klingon point of view? Or are there kind of compromises made, do you think? You know, as as I was reading it, I would say that maybe there's some compromises. I feel like the crew is maybe the safest crew in the Klingon Empire <laughs> or the most honest <laughs> in a sense. You know, I, I just almost feel like the whole tone of the book feels like this is a Klingon crew, but we're not going to make them so overly Klingon. We're going to make it kind of feel like a Starfleet crew that are Klingons. 
Does that make sense? D- I disagree with that uh, it, because, <clears throat> like, I so yeah, it's interesting to to think about that. Like, how does this square with what we might know of Klingons, and is he really just putting in things that are more? Uh, with with Starfleet in mind, I mean, I think one of the things that that I was impressed of, uh, impressed by right off the bat, is you know there there's this you know ceremony for the Order of the Batleth and all of that stuff, and then it's like the next thing is like let's go out there and conquer some worlds, you know. So already it's different than Starfleet, where it's like let's go out and explore. This is like we're going to go out, we're going to conquer, we're going to expand our empire, and, but then also like on on the, the the ship itself and all of the interactions, I think there were some. Th- like what's interesting is there are no Starfleet characters, but there is some Starfleet influence because you have a doctor who went to the Starfleet Medical Academy. See, and that's what like I'm that. thinking more along those lines. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How, however, I mean, I think that there, there there's some things that make a lot of sense with that because the the Federation and the Klingon Empire have been allies for quite a while, and we'll probably talk about this more later. But I think there are certain things that are starting to influence their society and transition it a little towards something else. But I think one of the things also Keith to Canada is interested in that I've seen him talk about in other places is that he feels for a lot of the episodes with Klingons, they can be more one dimensional. They're just like really aggressive and want to break stuff and kill people. Right. But for real society to function, it needs to be more than that. And so I think in in the novel, you do see a variety of different characters. And to me, it feels realistic with some of the influences that they would have from the outside while also trying to keep true to their traditions. To, to me, it felt it felt right, but but I could see how you know it, it might feel a bit different than what you would expect or what we've seen before. So I'm really glad you brought this up because it does seem to be almost two forces kind of pulling at the crew in particular and Klingon society, uh, speaking in a wider perspective. I want to read just just the uh, the little bit of the blurb on the back because I really love this kind of introduction to what this whole series is about. So these are the voyages of the Klingon Defense Force vessel IKS Gorkon, part of the mighty new Chancellor class. Its mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, and to conquer them for the greater glory of the Klingon Empire. So on the one hand, I'm really glad that we get this unique perspective in this book. They're out um, to conquer planets, and it's just a given that that's what we do. That's, you know, it's it's fine. It's ethically correct from the perspective of what we see in these books. And then, and you put this in the outline, Justin, I like this, that the wider Klingon society is also having all these influences from the outside. So we get kind of this interesting pull between, you know, the old guard idea of the Klingons and these kind of new ideas that are coming from the Federation, very specifically through the medical officer Borak. So for example, Clagg has replaced his arm with his father's arm in, we read, uh, Diplomatic Implausibility, where he first uh, gave the okay for the doctor to do that procedure. And there are several Klingon warriors who express their displeasure with this. They feel that a true Klingon warrior should show his injuries, like you say here, and not hide them behind false limbs. And this argument that I'm, I'm glad you brought up here too, because I really like this in the book. Kalis did not have disruptors warp or transporters. Should they not use those as well? So mm-hmm. I, I really <laughs> like this idea of these new ideas coming in and kind of, you know, tugging at the idea of the, of Klingon society. But, but I mean, in, in that scene where, where somebody is saying, well, you know, what about, you know, warp and disruptors and transporters? I mean, that's something we, I think we don't know quite how long they've had it, but they've had it for some hundreds of years probably. So there was some pull or some change in the society to accept that, I'm sure, at a certain point. And by now it's like, well, you know, those are the tools you use to conquer. So that's what we do. And and like in a way it's like, oh, you don't sh- you don't hide your injuries behind false limbs. It's like, well, you could see this as another tool to conquer because it makes someone a more effective warrior again. Or if you don't just have them die from their injuries, but they keep living, maybe it's a more effective way to conquer. So then it's interesting like to think about it in this Klingon context where they're always thinking about like what makes us more effective warriors and more effective at conquering. <laughs> Basically, right? we're seeing you know the Klingon society being affected by these things. Is that always a good thing, I guess? So you know, it's kind of 
one thing I always like about Star Trek is it causes us to examine real world issues through the context of science fiction. And it's almost like this is even one level more removed because it's through science fiction and through an alien culture. So my interest, of course, is in what this book has to say about humanity and and the people who wrote it. So being changed by outside influences and kind of changing your culture and, and going in new directions, is that always a good thing? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the situation. I mean, and also I think it's mirrored by what's what's happening to the other alien species that that we see on on this planet, where they're also having this discussion among themselves, like, well, maybe we can keep the Klingons from conquering us or being part of the Empire, but aren't we just going to be changed forever anyway? I mean, it's kind of the the the, the classic thing in Star Trek with the the Prime Directive and uh, affecting other other cultures. But in some ways, you also affect them by not contacting them. So it's like all of these decisions that they're making are having consequences that they need to to think about. And I think what ha- what's happening to Klingon society is maybe a little bit more more subtle. But it just kind of came to me in, in the novel and in thinking about it and all the things that have changed the Klingon society since Kalos, a lot of stuff, right? And they've come to accept some of that or have trouble with other things. And I think it's an interesting discussion because in our own world, we think about, you know, the influences that one country can have on on another. There, there's always this question like, is that a good influence? Is it a bad influence? Is it mixed? I, I just I don't know if there's a good answer, but it gets you to think about those things. It seems as if they view themselves as maybe softer than what they used to be because of their relationship with Starfleet. There's things that they do that they question, uh, are we doing this because, you know, Starfleet would do, you know, we're getting too soft and, you know, back in my day, we would have just gone and blown up the planet. We would have conquered these people and now we're getting too soft. So there's some of that debate in there, but I don't even know if it's really a, an influence of Starfleet that has caused that. Maybe it has, but I think it's just a, uh, a cultural change that happens over time. I think in some ways because of technology and it's been around for a long time and they've been out in interacting with other species and such that they've become more cultured themselves. And so their Klingons are advancing. They're becoming more structured and, and more adaptable to other planets and species and and fitting into the overall galaxy. And it's not all about conquering anymore. And I think that's one thing I got out of this book. It's, it's 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 something that is their objective, but they're okay. At least this crew is okay if it doesn't happen. They're not going to like kill themselves over it, right? But because it's been put into the context of what they would consider to be an honorable contest to decide it, it's it, it's almost like Keith the Canada is putting them into this situation where it's like. They feel like they have to accept something like that. Like, oh, it'll be glorious. Maybe we could just do it by ourselves as one ship, you know? Yeah, and that's where I feel like there's a, a parallel with Star Trek in here. There's, you know, honor is the prime directive here. It, you know, we have this crew mm. that's questioned, you know, they do something. And they say, well, it's the right thing to do because it's honorable. It's the same thing as Kirk or Picard or somebody saying, well, this is the right thing to do in this situation because of the prime directive. And then there's others who are like, well, screw the prime directive. This is what we want. Well, screw honor. This is what we want. Yeah. And I mean, that ha- can have consequences, right? Like for the prime directive, the Starfleet might watch a planet die, right? And for them fulfilling their honor, they might not conquer a planet, which is kind of a failure, <laughs> right? They're taking this risk. Well, let's uh, get a little bit into the plot of this. So we've alluded a bit to it. Basically, they're on this mission with a bunch of other ships all kind of spreading out over this sector of space, seeking new planets to conquer into the Klingon Empire. And they come across this planet that has several minerals and, and metals that the Klingon Empire can use. And they encounter the species on the planet who turn out to be almost, you know, as good warriors as the Klingons, if not better. Like, they're very strong. They put up heavy resistance. And the initial parties that that go to the surface meet heavy resistance and kind of get their nose bloodied a little bit and realize, okay, this is going to, we're going to have to commit more troops to this. But then through a parlay with the leaders of this world, they come to this other understanding 
that maybe through a series of contests, they can willingly submit to the Klingon Empire if Clegg and his crew are able to defeat them. But if Clegg and his crew are defeated, then they agree that the Klingon Empire will leave this world forever and leave them alone. And I really like what you said, Justin, about that kind of paralleling what's happening to the Klingons. These people are seeing a big shift in their society. And it's very intelligent of them to realize that they can't really stop it. You know, that once this, this, um, once Pandora's box has been opened, once the genie has been let out from the bottle and once the avalanche has started and whatever other metaphor you want to use, <laughs> the, you know, there's no stopping the changes that are going to happen to their society. And, uh, even if they lose or sorry, even if they win and the Klingons have to leave, they still will have this knowledge that they're out there and part of this bigger galaxy kind of thing. So I really like that idea that it parallels, you know, what's happening to the Klingons and what's happening to this race of aliens, the children of Santara, which also have a really cool name. I like them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it's, and, and I think the thing that you didn't mention that's really interesting is the only thing that gives this species, the Santara, a chance is that there are all of these subspace, like, anomalies over the planet so if you remove that and you didn't have that and they could just go in there with their disruptors blazing i don't think they have any chance but they mm -hmm. have a chance because it has to be this hand-to-hand -hand combat and i think it is interesting that they have this contest that they're that they're going through i mean i didn't quite know what to expect from this novel or what would happen but at first when there was this big battle i was like oh it's going to be a series of big battles and you know maybe there'll be something that'll happen that'll cause them to question what they're doing or some other foe will come in or something like that. So I was kind of pleasantly surprised that it became this series of contests because I think that was more interesting than if it was, if it was a series of, of battles and shows you something different. Cause I think, you know, when we think about Klingons conquering planets, it just seems like they're there to just make people submit, kill them quickly and be done with it. But they provided this surprising alternative. And I like that that's the, course that it takes in the novel i was going into this book not knowing if i was going to like it or not because i'm not that big into klingons i mean i like them but i don't know if i want a whole book about a klingon crew but i was surprised how much i was enjoying it because when we got to the planet and there's this talk about doing you know let's conquer this these species and, and take over this planet. And I thought, oh yeah, okay, here we go. It's just going to be all out war and this back and forth and trying to destroy one another, da, 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 da. But it was great because of those challenges. It wasn't about a war. It was this honorable decision between the Klingons and the Centara that there's this, okay, we've come to agreement. We're both warrior species and so let's do this challenge. And now I got invested in the challenges because I wanted mm -hmm. to see yeah. who was going to win and how they're going to handle it. And it wasn't just fighting. It was just all out war. And it also brought a lot of character development to the crew from those challenges. Yeah, you got to see a lot of, of who they who they are from, from these challenges, a lot more than you would if they were just fighting battles. And yeah, I think that the challenges in the contests were interesting. I, after a while, I came to think of it as the conquest Olympics. Like they had these Olympic competitions that were all about the prizes, the conquest of the planet. But yeah, it, it, I think Keith to Canada really came up with an interesting structure for it. And I found myself really looking forward to like, okay, what's the next contest? Who's going to be in it? What's going to happen? Who's the head? You know, I mean, I could tell though, if there was five, it would be like, you know, they'd be two to two at the end. It would be decided by the fifth one, but still it was, it was great to see. And the cool thing about these contests as well, they're varied. Like you said, there's a, you know, strength challenge. There's a fighting on, on sailing ships challenge. Sailing I ships. Yeah. I thought was really cool. <laughs> And just out and out fighting challenges and that sort of thing. And not only do we get to learn more about the officers and see their character development, but I think specifically because of this plot device, we learn a lot about the lower decks officers as well. So there's a number of, you know, ground troops that are assigned to the ship. It's, it's a large warship and it carries. Were you surprised by that number? It was like, what, 3000 troops or something? Yeah, it was huge. Yeah. Yeah, the Gorkon is a very large ship. Like we said, thousands of troops on board this ship. And we get to see one unit in particular, the 15th, uh, whose leader is a Klingon woman by the name of Wool. 
I'm not sure how to pronounce these names. I wasn't but sure. Whoa, whoa. Just going to be going with kind of the most obvious I can think of. And yeah, through these challenges, we get to see all of these different characters and their various strengths. Now, I'm going to say something, and you guys might laugh at this, but it just popped into my head because recently my girlfriend and I have been rewatching all of the Disney films, and we fairly recently watched Mulan. And the 15th group, the 15th unit, have all these different characters. There's this one really big, huge guy who's really strong and, you know, this kind of guy that makes lame jokes all the time and all this kind of stuff. And I was thinking of the guys that are a part of Mulan's unit when they're fighting. There's the big kind of husky guy who's really tough and all these ridiculous characters. And I don't know that I couldn't get that out of my head. <laughs> Am I crazy? No, I can see that. No, I, I, I can definitely see that because the, the 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 way these characters were described kind of fits some of those characters you're mentioning in Mulan, which is funny because uh, my kids and I were just singing Mulan songs before the recording. So maybe maybe nice. there is something in there <laughs> that I didn't even realize. And <laughs> I haven't seen it, so I can't uh, oh, tell you what you gotta I think. You've got to go watch oh, it right but... now. I got to say, okay, I'll be back I, in two hours. I first watched it for the first time like a month ago. I had never seen it okay. before. So it's it's worth it. It's good. <laughs> but but it was interesting. They had these thousands of troops, and then it kind of condenses down to squads of five. I thought that was a pretty small like unit of troops, but it made it really interesting with the different characters. Yeah, it I made think. me wonder what the other troops were doing. I mean, there's thousands of these Klingons. What are they doing all the time? Sitting in their <laughs> bunk bed, whittling their batleth. I don't know. <laughs> I thought that was interesting, too. They have these bunks where they're like stacked five high. Like, mm-hmm. All right, that's interesting. And I really liked the one character. Is it Goran, I think? who he's he's the big guy and the leader comes to take command of her unit which is the 15th unit which is kind of described as the worst of the best so they're kind of in the top ranks of the of the units but they're the bottom of that if that makes sense and she comes to take command of her unit and as the leader she's supposed to get the bottom bunk and (laughs) this guy's like no you can't have it (laughs) <laughs> I've, I've got it. She's like, uh, what do you mean? I The leader always gets the top bunk. And he's like, no, if I'm on the top ba- bunk, you'll die. <laughs> he's that big. So <laughs> I just love these personalities. It's it's a diversity you don't usually see among Klingons. It was great. Really I mean, cool. and like there, I don't think he was in the squad, but there was this guy, Gajoth, who was like constantly thinking of writing like an opera or a poem or a song or, you know, a novel. Or It was great. It was like these these touches where it's like, yeah, there would be somebody who'd be interested in that. He's not going to be about war all the time. So. Well, going back to what you were saying about Mulan, I mean, I wasn't thinking of Mulan, <laughs> but you know, Dan, it's like there was, because of those characterizations, you don't typically think of Klingons. It's like, Justin, what you were saying earlier, we're so used to seeing like this, you know, this one dimensional Klingon in a lot of different shows, but because of these things, th- there was times it was hard for me to even imagine or remember that I'm reading about Klingons because it seems really? so unKlingon like for this guy to go, Oh no, I was writing a poem. No, but it's a song now. <laughs> and it's like, wait, I mean, what kind somebody of writes that stuff, right? Exactly. I mean, there's, and that's the thing. There's so much diversity in Klingons that needs to be explored. And, and that's one of the things I even like about Discovery is dis- discovering other races of Klingons. And I mean, yeah, you need to have bankers. You need to have poets. You need to have all these different types of jobs. And we need to explore more of that. It's almost like, and, and I mean, in much, it, it kind of makes sense that a movie like Mulan would kind of arrive at the same type of characters as the writer of this book would, because they're kind of archetypes in a way, you know, there, there's, there's always the, the jester, the kind of foolish guy. And there's the, you know, strong guy. And there's the guy who's annoying, but you still appreciate him. So That's for example, in the show, <laughs> <laughs> for example, was it Davok? Was that his name? Who's kind of, yeah almost like the right winger guy who is spouting conspiracy theories and everybody thinks he's a fool, right? Yeah, Yeah. exactly. But they still appreciate the role that he plays and he's still an honorable warrior and that sort of thing. So now is he, I kind of like that. Is he the one spoiler alert? I'm going to just go ahead and put out there now. Everyone spoiler alert. Is he the one then (laughs) that died? (laughs) Yeah. His head goes flying. And his friend that always argued with him missed him because he, Mm. he misses the arguments. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. 
I like which that is a lot. again a very common lesson that's learned in you know adventure stories and that sort of thing. But so you that's know, it's like Odo it, and Quark. Yeah, it, so yeah exactly. Much, yeah. It might in some ways be a cliche, but it's one that works, and that's why it's in so many stories and why we can so easily and quickly yeah. identify but, with. But it. what's great is to is to see that in this novel, and I mean to to I think what's brilliant about it is to get the diversity. He doesn't have to, you know, go to what's going on on Kronos with all of the different professions. It's all within these people who are troops, but there's diversity within that. And I, th- that's what's really great. And I think it's great also that, <clears throat> that you know, characters are pulled, like in Diplomatic Impossibility, from certain episodes of The Next Generation or, or DS9 where you did maybe see more dimensional characters. Um like like Toke from Birthright and the Next Generation, or like Kurok from from Suspicions, they were kind of a little bit different kind of of characters than you'd seen before. And he was pulling them in. I think I saw it in, um, in Voyages of the Imagination that Keith De Canada was talking about the the characters that he put in the book, and he specifically put in all the ones he thought were more dimensional actually on the shows, so that he could build them out more. Yeah, but that's a pet peeve of mine, even from diplomatic implausibility. <laughs> I mean, even in this book, there were so many times you'd go through a couple chapters and one character is referring to a time that they did something with Worf, and then another character is talking about... It's the story of Worf, right, yeah, Dan? Ex- <laughs> exactly. Star Trek's the story of Worf. I mean, That's Worf it. is even in this novel. <laughs> and you just keep, they keep referring to Worf, and then there was somebody who hadn't interacted with Worf, but they had interacted with the Enterprise or so. It's like, it's all connected, you know? It's just a little too much. I, I, I could see that, although, I mean, there were a lot of characters that were introduced that we'd never seen before or didn't have any which of those was, kind of interactions. Which I appreciated that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it just it just speaks to the fact that Worf is just the most important Klingon in the galaxy, right? <laughs> most important being in the galaxy, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so... Speaking of characters and both characters that we've seen before and ones that are introduced as original characters, I want to focus right here on the female characters we see because this is kind of an aspect of Klingons that we don't necessarily get a lot of. And when we do get some of it, it's not really explored in depth like it is here. So we have several strong female characters. Kirak, who we've mentioned, was the Klingon scientist in Suspicions, who's the engineer of the Gorkon. Wool, who's the leader of the 15th Battalion. And Borak, the um, medical officer of the Gorkon. And there's also Cravor, who we saw before in the novel Diplomatic Implausibility. She was Worf's bodyguard, and she's a member of the 15th Battalion here as well. So there's all these strong female characters. And Justin, you mentioned that you thought they were some of your favorite characters in the novel. And I really have to agree with you there. You say that they often express different opinions and behavior than we usually see in on-screen Star Trek. How do you how do you mean that? Well, I mean, you know, for example, I mean, I think one of the things that let's take Kirak first, who who we, uh, oh God, it sounds like I'm <laughs> sorry, it sounds like I'm talking about Kirk as Kirak, but <laughs> <laughs> I am Kirak. But Sorry. I think that's how you pronounce it. I don't know. But anyway, so she was in Suspicions, and we saw her as a scientist, right? Which which is interesting and different. But uh, you know, just as a scientist that was kind of interested in this warp technology, but you know, seeing her as the chief engineer of a, a Klingon ship, like when on screen have you ever seen the chief engineer of a Klingon ship? I don't know if we have, right? Mm-hmm. So that that part first is very interesting because of course they have engineering, right? Um, so I think that that's interesting. That's a little different. She's you know really protective of her engines and almost made me think like, oh, she's kind of like Scotty, <laughs> right? Just like don't mess with my engines. Um, I mean, but but also like I think what's interesting that that's explored here is that it talks about some of her romantic relationships and um, the guy who's the first officer, Cornyn, is kind of harassing her right so she has to deal with all of these all of these difficulties and i think for you know for what you see with with female klingon characters on screen you see a little bit in places like matter of honor of of you know female klingon crew but not really like in their capacity as much of being part of the crew having to deal with crew relationships and pressures and things that that happen and she's also someone that you find out from her thoughts, she doesn't really want to be there, 
right? Mm-hmm. And that's just something that seems so unusual. She's doing it out of a sense of family duty, but as soon as she can get off this ship, she's going to. So that's what I meant, like as an example of like this feels different than than what we've seen before, even that I've I've read about uh, before. And I, I liked that you get to see how she how she thinks about things, right? So just as an example, you know. I hadn't thought about it until you guys mentioned about the female characters that they're some of your favorites. I I have to agree with you. I mean, as I'm going through the list of all the different Klingons in this book, my favorite characters, probably these three women that were mentioned are in my top five or maybe even my top three. And what I was surprised about is in the beginning of the book, this Kurak engineer character was one I didn't really care for all that much, but I grew to really like her more and more as the book progressed to the point that she became my favorite character in this book. Mm -hmm. And it was because she didn't want to be there and she's fussy about people touching her engines and she just had this attitude. But at the same time, she's kind of looking at things and going on around her like, this is so dumb and these things are so stupid that I'm just like, yeah, she's right. Exactly. (laughs) And the romantic relationship, the little triangle, I guess you would say that she's involved in, she deals with, you know, one guy that's like, Hey, yeah, I'm really interesting. She's like, no, thank you. Goodbye. Walks down a hallway. Oh, great. Now I got to run into the other one, you know, (laughs) Right. (laughs) and she handles it so well. And the other thing I was impressed with is I would expect in a book like this with female crew members that there would be a lot of guys being sexist towards them and, and treating them like they're second class because they're women and whatever. But there was not really any of that in this. They were treated equally. Not as much that. Yeah. And I, I really appreciated that too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and, and Karak may be my, my favorite character because yeah, it was, it was just like a really different perspective because I don't know if we've even seen, a Klingon before on a ship where they're just like, well, I don't know. I guess maybe in uh, Soldiers of the Empire they've lost so much that <laughs> they kind of don't want to be there. But it, I think it's a it's a rare thing. But but actually, I mean, I think one of my favorites also is is Wall, who's the 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 squad leader, because she has to kind of deal with suddenly being promoted to this position and how to deal with that and how to gain confidence and exude authority when you have this squad with this guy that is this, you know, Klingon giant and these people that are, you know, wisecracking or sarcastic or just, but she ends up really like getting a lot of respect from them and she's a great warrior. And there was just something about her character as well. Like she's kind of dropped into this situation. And I think we, I think she's the one where we find out as well that she uh, isn't part of a house because she, I think she, uh, you know, had some scandal that happened. Right. So that's also an interesting thing. Like, Oh, you're without a house, but you're serving here and you have to get people's authority. So she was like, now, and that's, I think that's the case with all these female characters. Like they're navigating all these difficulties and they're doing an amazing job of something that is just so tough to do with all that's thrown at. Yeah. I'm going to put in a vote for wall as possibly my favorite character in the book. I really enjoyed her story and the little hints we get about her past and kind of what's going on there. And I feel like it's not really fully revealed to us. It feels like there's still some mystery there exactly what happened and you know, where, what strata of society she occupied at one point, which is very different from where she is now. And I think that's one of the things that's great about this book as the first in a series is that I think there's, there's enough revealed that it doesn't feel like, you know, Keith to Canada is holding a lot back, but that there's enough room to kind of run with it and, and go further with it. I thought he did a really great job of that. Yeah. Dropping just enough to really kind of entice you to, to want to know more. Plus the, you know, let's face it, fairly cliffhangerish ending that I actually wasn't expecting. I thought these were a little bit more self-contained than they are. So uh, I was, uh, I, well, maybe we'll talk more about it later, but I was of two minds about it until it got to a certain point And then I was like, I know what's going to happen here. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> there is definitely but. a bit of that for sure. Uh, before we get there, though, um, I really like this topic here kind of juxtaposing the children of Santara and the Klingons and their similar views on the value of combat and honor. And the fact that they come to have a deep respect for each other at the start of this mission, you know, it's kind of unthinkable that the Klingons, you know, would make this deal with them. But by the end, 
they really are on equal footing as far as warriors go and, and their respect for each other. And I love that it goes both ways that, you know, it's very clear that even though from the children of Sentara's perspective, like if, if this were earth, for example, you'd see these guys as big, huge thugs come to conquer you and you just immediately want to resist them and throw everything you have against them. And, and no, we will never submit to anybody but they really come to have this mutual respect for each other's culture and, and what brought them there. And any time that I thought there was going to be a big culture clash in the book, the characters on both sides really surprised me by having an open mind. So, for example, I thought the medical procedures that, that the Santara are introduced to would just be repugnant and they, you know, these Klingons are savages and they don't know what they're doing. That's horrible. Like only the strong should live, but that feels like the cliche that they would normally go with. But instead the characters are very open-minded and, and really curious about each other, which was really cool. See, I think that's get gets to what I'm feeling about this book is it doesn't have those cliches. I think Keith DeCandido did a great job of saying, okay, I'm just not going to go with the typical tropes and the cliches of the Klingon cultures and stuff. Because again, when they're going to conquer worlds and they show up to this planet, I'm thinking, okay, I know what's going to go on. There's going to be this peace loving civilization. They've got along all this time and they've been left alone. And now the Klingons are going to come and conquer. Instead, this is another warrior race. And there's such a respect for each other that they don't go at each other i mean a little bit but i mean to the point that there's an honor between both groups that they can really relate to each other and they are more similar than they are different so i i really liked exploring that type of dimension between the klingons and this other warrior race because they've come to really respect one another and that goes on to the challenges and where, what leads then to the end of the book yeah I, I, something that's come into my head. So Dan, when you read the that from the back cover before, I was thinking that change a few words, and that could be about the Terran Empire. It could be about mm-hmm. you know conquering others for the glory of the Terran Empire, right? And so I think about that like you know Terran Empire wouldn't have anything to do with any contests like that. They'd be like, we're stronger, we're just going to obliterate you. But there is something. I mean, it sometimes it becomes. A, a, a bit of a cliche in in Star Trek that Klingons are or at least of a certain era are, are all about like honor and duty and all of that. But there 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 is something that's believable about how they go forward with it and how it makes this other thing possible for them. And I and I really like that because it it gives an alternative because yeah, if it was all just about the the conquest and you know let's just let's just pour thousands of troops on the planet until they're totally subdued. But there's also I think a wisdom in what Clag does because he's like these are fierce warriors and they're going to try to resist us to the end. Is it really worth our resources to do that? You know what does it mean to conquer a planet where you'll have continual resistance to the bitter end? Like is that worth it? Would that take too many of your resources? So he sees a way if it works out to get them to willingly submit themselves. And, and I think that the, the way that it's set up, if the, the Klingons had, you know, won three out of the five contests, this species, the children of Santara would have been like, you have proved yourself worthy. What can we do for you? And I could totally see them becoming part of the Klingon empire, becoming warriors on their ships and, or something like that. So I think it's interesting, the possibilities that it opens up that are different than if you're thinking of conquest just for the sake of it, or just because, you know, they're evil or something, well, and, right? And when they were going through the challenges, I was actually rooting for the Centara because I want yeah. them to... To, I, I want them and the Klingons to really be a part of each other. Like I, wait, well, so wait, it would be the Klingons that needed to win, and if the Klingons would need to win for them to be part of the and empire, and that's what I wanted. Mm-hmm. That's what I meant that's to say. That's yeah. what I wanted. To I say. almost did too. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I, like, I found myself in a really odd position of wanting that too. Like, wait it's a minute, like, what conquer am I them. waiting for exactly? <laughs> the conquest of a planet? Like, how did this book make me want this planet to be? Conquer because <laughs> you want to see Santara on a Klingon ship. I mean, that's what I wanted yeah. to see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could totally see that they would have respect for each other, and if they were allowed to, they would just serve together in battle. Now, whether that could actually happen because of, I think, the usual prejudice that because even in this in this uh, novel, what I think is interesting is that there's this scene, I guess, in their mess hall where 
you see someone from a conquered species who's basically whose job is to like clean up the the leftovers that fall on the floor, right? They're just like this servant that nobody really wants to deal with and it has really menial work. So would it cause them to change so that they would want them to actually serve as warriors instead? I don't know. It just, yeah, I was almost ruining for that. Like, what would that be like? How would that change their society, you know? And I think it's a testament to how it gets you to really feel that you're understanding the Klingon culture, I think in a way I haven't really before and their motivation and what all this means to them. You know, it's, it was really not something. not just understand, but like the Klingon culture. Yeah. Like yeah. I can read this novel and not be rolling my eyes like, ugh, Klingons. Like, uh, like I like what I'm reading here. I, I like what they're doing. I mean, yeah. I don't want them to conquer worlds, but it, you know, every time we think about the Klingons conquering worlds, we're just assuming that the world doesn't want to be conquered. Well, why not have a world that say, yeah, I want to be part of the Klingon empire. Yeah, let's do this. And it's, it's really funny because for example, I was kind of thinking in my head of the Klingon approach versus the Federation approach. And if the Federation came across this planet, they'd be like, oh, these guys are primitive. They have no technology to speak of. We have to leave them alone completely and not touch them. And the Klingons are like, we'll elevate you. We'll bring you into our empire. You can have this medical technology and all this stuff. Now, I'm anti-colonial. so <laughs> you know, Yeah, it is a colonial view, right? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Which I'm very fundamentally against. But at the same time, I'm like, what's better for the society in this case? And I mean, I don't, I don't presume to know the answer to that. Because if I were, and, and this is going against almost everything I believe in, but if I were part of a primitive society that had no technology, and I could see these miracles like the medical miracles and that kind of stuff being performed i'd want to know that and i'd want to be a part of that so it, i i found myself really torn here because i'm not sure what the right answer is and it's kind of a testament to this book that it made me kind of flip on that in this case and maybe think about it this way right like compared to a lot of the cultures in star trek we in the 21st century earth are primitive, right? Mm -hmm. And they would have much more advanced technology. So like, would it, it's almost a question like, would you rather uh, not have contact with a civilization like that? Or if they had something to add, like the Vulcans, let's say, would you rather they come whether you know, you're at that their level or not, you know, in order to improve their society because you could save all... The, I mean, it's the same kind of, of thing, right? Because they're probably thinking about like, wow, this medical technology, this could actually help us to, you know, heal people when they couldn't otherwise have people we love live longer and go on to fight more battles. You know, there's probably something very attractive to it. Practically speaking, given the history of what happens when a really technologically advanced group meets a lower, probably not good generally, but on the face of it, yeah, it'd be hard to say no, right? I don't know. <laughs> but it would change things forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, for sure. You're, you're on a different trajectory at that point. Definitely. Yeah. And I, I like that they kind of address the inevitability of it too. Like I mentioned earlier that, you know, things are going to change and there's really, it, it's inevitable at this point, which was interesting. And this must be a really small planet because I didn't get the feeling that this was <laughs> a large group of people. It seemed more like a tribe or a town or something like that. And if you want the minerals of this planet, I think you could avoid them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was one part towards the end where they kind of alluded to the fact that uh, during the final contest uh, between Clegg and the leader of this village, that there were people from other villages kind of they'd gotten word that the fate of their world was being decided <laughs> by this village which is kind of funny it's just like happens to be the hap it just happens to be like the biggest village on the planet so i guess they're <laughs> yeah it, i mean it has, it, it has a, actually now that i think of it a bit of the problem that you see in star trek sometimes where it's like you go to a planet but really it's only one town or a couple of towns right. it didn't feel like it was people from like all these continents because it, they don't really have the transportation to do that but it made it seem like part of their conquest plan for for the klingons was okay let's find what the biggest town is let's conquer that then let's call in the fleet and they can conquer the rest of the cities but like are they giving word to everyone else that the fate of their planet's at stake or what 
<laughs> you know, I mean, maybe the best champion they could have isn't in this biggest village, but is halfway across their world. You know, yeah, maybe a lot of the species, the Santara, are listening to podcasts to hear what's happening. They're listening to Santara <laughs> FM. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, but they didn't even have that that level of technology. I don't think that's true. They don't. So I don't. Yeah, how does word get around? I guess birds with like little messages. I don't know. Send a raven. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, as we kind of alluded to, there's there's the five contests that they have to you know complete in order to win control of this planet, and predictably. Well, actually, there's initially four, and then if there's a tie afterwards, it would come down to a fight, a sword fight between Clagg and the leader of this village. And of course, because it's a narrative story and we like how narrative stories work on our planet Earth here, it does come down to that fifth contest. And predictably, not predictably, I don't know. How did you guys see this going? Did did that contest end the way you thought it would? Well, you know... I- like while while it was going on, because this is a long contest. <laughs> I mean, for for some of these, I'm like, wow, they're sword fighting for like hours and hours. Okay, but but like th- th- there was a certain point where I was like, hmm, maybe this could go either way. But then as the authors started talking about the problems with Clagg's right hand, I was like, oh, he's going to lose because they've been kind of alluding to the weakness and to this batleth fighting and all of that. So he's going to lose. So I I knew at that point that that he was he was going to to lose uh, and and i guess part of it's be like when when these contests were going on some of them were taking so long i was like is what's going to happen here they'll just do like three or four contests and then the next one will be like in the next book or something but then when it was clear that there was going to be the fifth one i could tell that that clag was going to to lose and i could tell exactly what was going to happen afterwards which maybe we can talk about in a little bit so i think it was unpredictable for a while but when it got to a certain point i was like i i see where this is going well i kept thinking during this sword fighting clash that well there's more books so clag obviously is not going to get killed so he's going to either lose and they're not going to kill him or he's going to kill the santar that he's fighting and when it looked like he was going to lose, I kept thinking, oh, last minute, he's going to do something like he's going to the centaur is about to kill him and says, oh, sorry, you lost. And now I'm going to, to kill you. And all of a sudden, you know, Clag does something like, you know, just to surprise him, like he had a little surprise ending here to kill. I don't know. Um, I, I guess it kind of played out the way I expected it. I, I didn't like that the Santara. Uh, didn't kill Clag though, if he was winning. Why? Because I felt like that was the objective. You know, the objective was to fight to death. And he was about to kill me. He says, nope, you know, I'm not going to do this. Right, but that... But I think that ties into what we were talking about before. They've come to have deep respect for each other. So it, it I think it's it's transcended what it was or, originally, and it's become something where he wants to have mercy on Clag because Clag has been honorable enough to give them this chance. But they also set up these games for their own species. They didn't create these for the Klingons. So that tells me that if a Santara and another Santara were in this situation, they would kill each other. They have respect for each other as a race. Yeah, but I think this is different because it's meant to send a message that I don't, I don't yeah, I, I guess I hadn't thought about it much, but to me it felt right that that it was just a gesture of of respect for for clag and even agreeing to this contest and abiding by it and all of that i know and i agree but it works but i still think it would have been really dramatic if he killed him (laughs) i think that would have been something like up new captain for the next book yeah and it's (laughs) wool oh i'd be on board sure (laughs) yep no i like clag clag's awesome (laughs) so yeah basically uh the leader of the centara disarms clag and uh I imagine like the dramatic scene, like, whoo, the Batleth just like flies out of the circle and it stuns silence. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I kind of like that. Like it just, I, that's one thing. This book was very visual. Like I could really picture a lot of what was going on. Um, oh, and I, I'm actually just as a little aside, how did you guys picture the Centara? I kind of started out thinking of them as like Chewies, <laughs> like Wookiees or something. I don't know. Well, I could see that. I was thinking them as, as like really tall gremlins, but. 
<laughs> oh, interesting. Uh, I didn't picture them like furry. Chewies or Wookies or anything. I guess it more uh, like werewolves. Not uh, not quite, mm. but well, I think they did mention they have like a snout or yeah. something like that. Oh, that's true. So yeah, it kind of clashed with my image, but eh. <laughs> well, anyway. So after this, of course. Uh, they, the Centara one and Clegg honors their agreement and says that the Klingons will leave them alone and, and not bother them again. And I think like Justin, I knew exactly where the story was going uh, yeah. to go now. <laughs> General's not going to like that. <laughs> we'd been set up about how dishonorable this general is. And he's kind of in league with Clegg's brother, which is this whole other subplot that I was kept expecting would get paid off in this book, but it's clear they're setting things up, of course, for things to come. And the general basically says, no, that was ridiculous. You don't make deals with, you know, these, these inferior species. We're sending the fleet in, tell us how to get through the subspace eddies that protect the planet. And we're going to take it. And Clagg and the crew of the Gorkon end up with this dilemma at the end. And, you know, dilemmas and conflicts are at the heart of really good stories. And I love this dilemma at the end. And that whole scene with him and Cornyn, who we haven't really talked about. He's, again, another character brought in from uh, another source. He was in Soldiers of the Empire. He was the short-haired Klingon in that episode. This first officer is kind of unimpressed Clegg this whole time. And Clegg has got his hand on his dagger and <laughs> is waiting to find out what Cornyn thinks they should do. And he says, you know, we can take up arms against the Klingons and defend honor, or we can be honorless and help, you know, defeat these people. I want to know what you think. And Cornyn surprises him and says, we should take up arms against the Klingons and stand and fight for honor. And when Cornyn outlines the dilemma that they face, you know, if they follow General Talek's orders and take the planet, they're worthless as Klingons. Their honor is worth nothing. But if they take up arms against the Klingons, they will almost certainly die and probably die in disgrace because no one will know why they did it. They will have been traitors. This may just be me, but I was thinking about Jean Valjean and Les Miserables. And when he sings the song, who am I? And he sings, if I speak, I am condemned. If I stay silent, I am damned. You know, it's this fundamental dilemma, like what to do either way, you're kind of screwed. And I just love this ending to this book. Yeah. I mean, I think like you, Dan, I knew that the general wasn't going to like it. It had been set up that way. Uh, plus if for whatever reason it had been set up so the general would like it, I mean, there's not really a reason for another book but um <laughs> but but at the at the same time this guy corn and i think it could have kind of gone either way and he could have just you know killed him and talk becomes the first officer and whatever but but i think it's interesting and also <laughs> the other thing that this made me think of is there's a superior officer that's giving these orders to do something that they think is dishonorable it's like insurrection Klingon style, isn't it? <laughs> like you've given me these orders. No, I'm not going to do that. Um, but I think that was really interesting and it sets up something interesting for, for the, the next novel with them being able to join arms with the, the Centara after they've gotten all this respect. So yeah, I, I liked it quite a bit. Um, even if I could kind of see where it was going, I think it was done really well. Yeah, it is pretty obvious to know where it's going, but you also want it to go there because it's obvious, you know? Mm -hmm. so. Well, because it makes it more interesting because there's more players that'll be brought in in the second book, right? Yeah, and and yeah, that's what makes it. And I think what the second book's called Honor Bound, right? It is, mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I'm just trying to think with that title and what we know that's coming, how that all is going to, to play out in this. It's all going to be about honor. I think that's been set up too. It's like I said earlier about the prime directive, the honors, the prime directive for the Klingon culture. And I love, and I never thought of this. I didn't realize what Clegg was talking about when he said, you know, we have allies and Cornyn, I was kind of with Cornyn. I was like, oh yeah, the Centara, they'll fight with them, you know, avatar style, I guess they'll be, <laughs> they'll be the Ewoks. Sure. And then he's like, well, yeah, them for sure. But also 
I'm part of the Order of the Batleth. And they kind of, they had this Chekhov's gun from the very beginning where Martok talked about how the Order used to be this organization that kind of came when the torches were lit for honor. And and that's what Clegg is doing now is he's kind of putting in the call for them to come. They've set it up that way. But one thing I wondered was, I mean, somebody was even commenting like with what Martok was saying, like they don't usually talk about this at these ceremonies. Is there some reason why Martok would have highlighted that? Or he just knew that to put out the call in case something was going on in a conquest that wasn't honorable? I don't know. I don't know. I kind of wondered that myself. Uh, It'd be interesting to know if there was a reason why and if Martok had some kind of uh, prescience about about maybe he knows who his chief of staff is and is like this guy is a dishonorable jerk and <laughs> just fyi <you> know? <laughs> and of course after i read that i was like Worf is part of the order of the bat left there's going to be more Worf. <laughs> yep i okay. thought of that too no, absolutely no, no 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 keep Worf out i mean i like Worf, but come on we don't need to <laughs> always introduce a tng character in every book <laughs> But but like so the other thing like if we're talking about maybe what it leads into next is when they talked about these subspace eddies and that they found out I think eventually I think his talk finds out that it seemed like it was subspace weapons from some time ago and I thought for a little time like are we going to see whoever that was that caused that come back yes I was kind of wondering the that too yeah because yeah. Imagine if that happens, like they come back and there's the General's Task Force and there's a Santara and there's Clegg's ship and it could be really interesting. And it's got to play out. There's got to be something that comes up. You think so because they keep talking about it and you're just intrigued. Like who are these people that are fighting with these weapons that you can still see the effects of centuries later? I bet it's going to be they're going to hint at that at the end of the second book and then it leads into the third. I like that. Could very well be. Well, I guess... Let's talk a bit about our final thoughts and ratings for IKS Gorkon, book one, A Good Day to Die. Uh, Justin, what are your final thoughts? Well, I mean, maybe as as listeners can tell from the way I've been talking about this, I love this novel. I think it's something that's really unusual to see something that is so centered and focused on Klingons. I mean, I mentioned the final reflection, and that's centered and focused on Klingons as well. But I felt like this was even more so, and it was definitely from the perspective of the Klingons themselves, whereas something like The Final Reflection was actually part of somebody who wasn't a Klingon telling you what was going on. So this this felt like more of a a kind of way of just seeing inside a, a Klingon ship, which I think we got some glimpses of in things like Matter of Honor. But this, I think, really goes in depth, and you see a variety of different characters, some great uh, male and female characters, and I, I was definitely like what I, 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 I've loved Klingons and all the different incarnations, but I was going into this and I was like, well, but can you really sustain that for a whole book? And I think Keith DeCandido really sustained it for the whole book. And I was really, you know, loving a lot of the, the characters and really getting invested in them and wanting to know what happens to them next. So when this Klingon, <laughs> Klingon when this cliffhanger happened, <laughs> Klingon cliffhanger happens, I, I I really want to to read the next book right away, um, and so I think it's there there and I think there are other things that we could have could have talked about. I think there are some different things in these different contests that are really interesting the way that they go about things. So I think he managed Keith to Canada managed to have a really great variety of characters and have a really engaging story. Have you invested in the characters and also kind of build up both characters that we have seen before in TNG and DS9 and ones we've never seen before. I mean, I I didn't feel like anybody was really a one-dimensional character. They all had different dimensions and things that uh, were just fascinating to to see. So I I, I love this novel. I think it's it's one of my favorites now. Probably can't wait to read the other three books (laughs) when we get to them. Um, But yeah, if I had to give this a rating... You know, before I talked about these events as like the Conquest Olympics, I want to see like the full contact figure skating at these Conquest Olympics. <laughs> and if they had that and this book was in that competition, I would give it a 9.5 on the scorecard. Nice. Awesome. How about how about you, Bruce? What are your final thoughts here? I have to echo a lot of what Justin said. I mean, even before we started recording, I thought, you know, what am I going to give this as my final rating? What are my final thoughts on this? And 
I the first thing that popped in my mind was characters. And I've said that on the show before. There's certain novels I read, and what really sells it to me is the characters. And that's what's happened in this book. Klingons seems a lot of times in Star Trek can be one-dimensional characters. And every time I approach a book lately that is a Klingon book, I'm like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to like this. But every Klingon book we've read so far here on Literary Treks, I've actually really liked. And I think it's because we're getting a more in-depth look at Klingon society and these characters and the characters now become more real and more interesting. And that's what makes it work. It doesn't matter if they're Klingons or something else, as long as you invest and develop characters that are interesting and give us the backstory and good relationships between the characters, then it really works. And that's what works in this book for me. It's character, character, character. I will give this book four challenges out of five. Nice. Yeah, I have to echo a lot of what you guys say. I really enjoyed this book. I think, and I I mentioned this before, I think, you know, you can have a story about Klingons, you know, whatever. It's ultimately a story written by human beings. And it's kind of what it tells us about ourselves that's really revealing. The Klingon angle, I think that's a really cool way to do this story and to look at it through the eyes of another culture. And I think that tells us a lot about ourselves as well. And the idea of maybe a Klingon television show, something like that, that people have said over the years, I don't think something like that sustainable, but you know, a novel or a series of novels that the real diehard fans of Star Trek are going to sit down and and enjoy. I'm behind that all the way. I think this is a really cool idea and it's made me even more excited to read the other books. And also I should mention the historian's note of this book talks about the fact that there's a story in the brave and the bold duology by Keith DeCandido as well. And I I had always known that that was in there, but I didn't realize it took place before this novel. So we get a bit of uh, allusion to that story, a battle at Narendra 3, famous from yesterday's Enterprise. And, uh, you know, I'd really like to read that someday. And there is also, if you guys all want to, you know, check everything off the list, there's also a Clag Gorkon story in the Tales from the Captain's Table anthology book out there as well. So uh, a short story, of course, Clegg in the captain's table telling his story as well. So, you know, there's a lot out there. And also this crew and this ship has shown up in other novels as well as kind of guest stars here and there. So I like the footprint and the mark that Keith DeCandido has made on the Star Trek novel verse with these books. And I'm glad we're finally getting a chance to read them. So if I have to give a rating, I'd have to give 26,402 seeds passing into the basket uh, with Goran holding the uh, the stone for that amount of time. Second place, it's not quite as long as the other person was able to do it, but still very, very impressive. You gave this rating a lot of thought. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had to quickly flip to the right page in the book <laughs> to find it, and I managed to do that while you guys were talking. I was still listening. Twenty six thousand four hundred four. Do, 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 do. Are we going rent? Is that what we're doing now? I, I was going to say like twenty six thousand four hundred two seeds in the basket. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a great rating. <laughs> <laughs> well, Justin, thank you so much for joining us. We really love having you on the show. Where can people find you? Well, you can find me elsewhere on Trek FM, co-hosting Earl Grey. That's our uh, next generation show. Uh, I co-host that with Amy Nelson and Richard Marquez every week. We have a great time talking about the next generation. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at TrekFan4747, where I tweet about nothing but Star Trek. And you can also find me on a couple of uh, groups on Facebook that focus on Star Trek books and comics. There's the Star Trek books community group, the Star Trek books discussion group, and literally Star Trek. And I will pretty often post my reviews of the different novels that I read, including this one. So hope you'll join me there as well. Awesome. Well, thanks again. We really appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Justin. It was great being here. Thank you. Well, it was great to have Justin on and really dig into the IKS Gorkin and get really into these characters and the whole storyline. I'm I'm actually really excited about getting to book two. Yeah, I am too. I actually had no idea that this would be a cliffhanger ending. I kind of thought it was, 
you know, a series of books, but not necessarily really tightly connected, just kind of the ongoing voyages of the IKS Gorkon. But it's really cool that the next book will definitely continue on directly from this novel. And I'm glad you mentioned about the Brave and the Bold book too. We actually did get an email from a listener. His name is Russell. And his email points out, and this is what he says, quote, just finished listening to episode 242. If you plan to continue the adventures of the IKS Gorkon, you also should include the Brave and the Bold 2 book series by Keith R.A. DeCandido as in the fourth part, book two, part two. The Gorkon crew reappear. Keep up the excellent work. I heard about, yeah, because in the beginning of the book, Keith mentions about that book. And I was like, oh, now I want to go and read that. So it's not on the schedule, but maybe at some point we'll actually hit these, the brave and the bold books at some point. Yeah, we might have to circle back and hit them. Um, I've heard good things about them. I don't know a lot about them. But yeah, it obviously they allude to this battle at Narendra 3 that they take part in before the novel we just read. So you know, it'd be nice to kind of circle back and, and get that on the schedule. Maybe someday for sure. Yeah. Just adding another book on the list or two or three <laughs> or whatever. Exactly. Well, it's been fun talking about the never ending infinite cycle of Star Trek novels today, but it's not the only thing we've been discussing on the network. So here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.FM, Earl Grey. However, one thing Everyone's I do Everyone's left- going to sing the song, Everyone Join Me. Life for No, I will not join you. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, Where however. Are you? Le- <laughs> Meta Trex. Speaking of character, I always found it interesting how many ways Q manifests himself, the characters that he takes on. We see him as a Starfleet commander, a Bajoran waiter. We see him as an alien captain. Uh, this this Q's is just a, man a cosplayer. Of many, <laughs> this is a man of many faces. Who knew Q was such a theater geek? The Edge, a Star Trek Discovery podcast. I felt like I was in a Vegas casino and the bling, bling, yeah. bling, like it... <laughs> Was the jackpot. And I'm like, wait a minute, what's going on? How is she affecting the replicators and that's throwing food out? I've never seen a replicator throw food out. Melodic treks. Well, it was definitely about a lower budget. There was no question that we could not afford Jerry Goldsmith. And later, by the time we got to do Star Trek VI, we couldn't afford Jamie Horner. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. So check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple eater, then you keep the doctor away. And if you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they are published. And please leave us a star rating and written review because we haven't had one since July. Just saying. And if you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, YouTube, and in most third-party apps. And you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. If you'd like to play an active role in helping us keep all of our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, your own serving of gach, and more, available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, distribute, and pay for all that gach each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways you can do that. The best place to join in the larger conversation is the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and boom, it should come right up. And if you'd like to send us an email, you can do that too by going to our form on the website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select literary treks and that will come right to us and you can also find the network on twitter 
at Trek FM and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Trek FM. For literary tricks, we also have a Goodreads group where we have bookshelves with all of our previously covered books, as well as the currently reading section so you know what's coming up for future shows. Plus, there are great conversations happening about all of the books and comics that make up the Star Trek literary universe. Just search for Literary Treks on Goodreads.com and click Join Group, and one of us will let you write in. We'd like to thank Norman C. Lau, Ken Tripp, Greg Rosier, Brandon Chemutala, Justin Ozer, and Jeffrey Harlan for their support of the Trek FM network and for being associate producers for Literary Treks as well. Now, Bruce, when you're not throwing back your head and laughing uproariously like Captain Clegg does about 40 times or so in this novel, where can we find you? <laughs> you can find me on Twitter at Admiral underscore rex you can also find me here on the network doing a show called back live from the edge every time a discovery episode premieres i record that show live on youtube and of course i'm talking about star wars or the star wars report but who cares about that and you can find <laughs> me in the babel conference and dan ha, when you're not being a klingon and you're going around doing things that humans do that we find annoying. Where can people find you? <laughs> well, I don't even know what to say to that. You can find me on Twitter. I'm at Kurtrats. That's K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. You can find me on YouTube.com slash Kurtrats Productions talking about Star Trek. You can find me on Facebook.com slash Kurtrats Productions. And of course, in the Babel Conference, usually lurking, but sometimes talking. <laughs> And laughing uproariously. Ah. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for listening. And until next time, live long and read on. What do you call that light reading? To each his own, number one.